Okay, and welcome to another Ask GMBM Tech. This is the weekly show where I get to answer your mountain bike tech related questions. Don't forget you can email yours into the email addresses on the screen at the moment, or you can add them in the comments below. Right, so first up, we're gonna kick it off with a question from Gregory Kukinski. How do the filmmakers of GMBM do the follow cam shots looking back on rough terrain while you're, while you're riding? Um, Basically, it's done with a gimbal. So we wear like um, a GoPro style chesty mount, wear it in reverse with a gimbal facing backwards and a GoPro on the back. But it doesn't always work depending on the stance of the rider and stuff. So on screen at the moment should be some footage of Blake riding with Martin following him and I'm behind Martin. So to get the footage for that trip, I had a GoPro on my helmet under the peak facing forwards looking at Martin. Martin wore a gimbal facing backwards and facing forwards and Blake had one facing backwards to capture Martin. But you don't always have to have a gimbal, that's the expensive way of doing it. You can do a similar sort of result by having the camera on your helmet facing backwards. Now it doesn't always work on rough terrain because you're moving around a bit more and you're never going to get the rider quite framed as well but you can get a really good effect using it and the in-camera stabilization now that's built into GoPros is pretty good so you can get a good result so give that one a try and see how you get on. Okay next up we've got a question from Dan's Garage Projects. Uh, hi Doddy, did you know that the inch gear measurement was originally thought up as a way to compare penny farthings? Uh, isn't it interesting that after all these years the technology's moved on, we still use the old fashioned techniques? Yeah, actually I did know that, but only because I was doing research on the Sheldon Brown website. So yeah, as you say, you know, like the bigger the wheel, the bigger the gear, basically. It's that, that simple in that case, and we use that to apply the same with chaining size and gearing size. Um, but something I didn't mention last week when I was talking about Sheldon Brown is he actually sadly passed away in 2008, so it makes him a bit more than just a bike tech wizard. He's a bit of a legend as far as I'm concerned, so he's probably the bike tech legend there is on the bike scene, even today with him sadly no longer with us. So definitely check out his website. There's a link in the comments below definitely check it out and look at some of the amazing work that the guy has done over the years. It really is something worth talking about. Okay, next one is from Dennis. Can you do a comparison between the range of Shimano and SRAM brakes? Um, yeah, actually we've been talking about doing some sort of buyer's guide, so looking at the different spec ones, different size rotors and what you get for the money. Um, so that will be coming, so hopefully that will answer your question. But what I can tell you is the fundamental difference between SRAM and Shimano brakes is the fact Shimano uses mineral oil and SRAM uses DOT. Now DOT oil comes from the motoring industry and DOT stands for Department of Transportation. So that is a standard that it has to adhere to for vehicle safety. Basically, so the oil has to pass a certain boiling temperature and it has to have characteristics that can be adhered to by those strict sort of standards. Now, as a result, it's a very cheap oil to use, so it's really good, but it is very corrosive. So it's bad for your bike frame if it gets on that, it's bad for your skin and other stuff. Whereas the mineral oil version, again, it's got a good boiling temperature and stuff, but it doesn't have to adhere to any sort of standards as such. So Shimano use that, Magura and various other people do. And the thing is, without having to adhere to a standard, they can actually make the oil and the brake combination in their eyes, probably a better match because they can cater it to their exact sort of specification. One thing that's really important over dot fluid that this has is, A, it's not corrosive, so it's not bad uh, on your bike or on your skin, but it doesn't absorb fluid over time. So dot can absorb moisture from microscopic holes in the brake lines over time, or even if it's just in the container on the shelf and it's been opened, the fluid will actually sort of absorb some moisture into it, which lowers the boiling temperature and changes the characteristics of the brakes. Now, even if this is only slight, it does mean you do have to replace that fluid from time to time, whereas mineral fluid doesn't suffer from the same thing. Now, the downside of mineral fluid is the fact that it relatively is very expensive for what it is, whereas DOT is very cheap. So they both have their positives and negatives, and they both work very well for mountain bike applications. But we'll go into this with the brake shootout at some point soon. Uh, next up, we've got a pretty punchy question from Raymond Black. Uh, hi, Doddy, quick question, hopefully with a quick yes or no answer. You said um, you can use silicon lubricant on suspension forks. Can you also use it on a dropper post? Thanks. Yes, there's your answer. Nice and simple, it does the same job effectively. The post is telescopic, you're looking after a seal. Those seals basically come from the suspension world anyway, so they do the same job as keeping the moisture in and keeping the grime out. So the silicon lube is very good for that. Interesting one here from um, Side Real Bow 64 and Fat Sphere is here. 
can we do a video on different cassettes and how to mount them? Um, actually, I'm gonna go upstairs to the workshop and show you how to do that, because it's really simple. There's basically three types of cassette. There's the E13, which I discussed last time. There's the SRAM system, and then there's the Shimano system. Now, the SRAM and E13 use the same driver body, and the Shimano system uses the sort of more traditional one. So I'll show you how to do that right now. Let's take a very quick look at the cassette. So this is a SRAM Eagle. Ignoring the fact it's 12 speed, it's got a massive dinner plate style 50 tooth on the top. It's the same design as their 11 speed cassettes. And this uses a single piece design that pushes on and screws onto an exclusive SRAM XD driver body. This is the E13 style one. It's a two piece design. The upper screws onto that same SRAM XD body using this lock nut. And then the lower part of the cassette, you use a chain whip to lock it in place. And then this is the Shimano system. So the difference between the three of them really, so the SRAM one has got 10 tooth sprocket. The E13 one's got a 9 tooth sprocket and that's why both of those have to have their exclusive mounting systems. The Shimano one is basically the authentic original one. So basically it's a multi-piece design and it has a lock ring at the bottom with an 11 tooth sprocket. So this is how they go on. Okay, so the SRAM system, it literally pushes on, cassettes all in and do this up with a spanner and then that is that cassette fitted, that is done. So E13 one, similar principle to SRAM, outer plate goes on, pushes home, you then do up the lock nut that holds this in place, they provide you with the tool to do this with, in which case you then tighten it up using an adjustable spanner or one of these tools. You would then remove that tool, outer piece goes on, and then using two chain whips, you lock this in place until it lines up with the locked. That's that one done. Okay, so this is the Shimano style body. Bunch of slots, slotted grooves on here. Note that one of those is always bigger than the rest of them. That is how you fit the Shimano cassettes by eye. You look for the bit with the biggest size notch, and that slides on. Slide them on accordingly. So you slot those all on, you get the lock ring, and you tighten up the lock ring. You adjust that with a adjustable spanner until that's nice and tight. And there you go. That is the three differences between the major cassette designs out there. Ah, a bit of a random question from Kyle's Wild World. How long till hover bikes exist? Well, actually, I kind of do. So. I don't know if you know about him or not, there's a guy called Colin Furs, he's got a really big YouTube channel. If you don't know, check it out. Again, the link is below in the description. Now, he's a bit of a mad scientist and he pretty much makes anything imaginable. But you've got to see this one. Um, I don't know what to describe about it other than a hover bike. It looks like the most outrageous thing you've ever seen. Yeah, and just to say that we would love to do something with Colin Furs because we think you're wild and nuts in the best possible sense. We've got some great collabs we'd love to work with him on, so uh, you never know, maybe we will. Let's see what happens. Okay, Nick Williams, loving the channel, guys. Uh, I have a RockShox Pike RC 130mm travel fork. I'm thinking of bumping the fork up to 140 or 150. Can I do it by modifying the fork and would I need to change my rear shock to compensate? Um, no, if you're only going up 10 or 20 mil, that's fine. Uh, so with RockShox forks, you do find that you don't need to change the external of the fork at all. So the legs will have markings on them for sag for the various different travel options that you can convert that fork to essentially. There is a part you need internally, it's an air tube, and I looked these up, they're approximately 35 quid, something like that, $35. Um, and if you get your fork serviced, it won't cost you any more to have one installed other than the cost of the part itself. You can do this yourself, but if you're gonna get them serviced, you may as well get it done at the same time. Good luck with that. WLAN Warrior 2000. At the moment, I have a 60 millimeter stem on my all mountain bike, 140 mil travel, but my bike has quite a long top tube. For that reason, I want to get myself a shorter stem. I like riding very aggressively, but I also want to be able to pedal up mountains. Should I go for a 35 or a 45? If I was you, I'd probably go for the 45 because it's quite extreme going for the 35. You're pretty much halving the length. But make sure you take into account the height that you have your stem at on your steerer tube for your spacers above or below it, and the type of bar you're going to have with that. So generally, if you're going for a shorter stem, you probably want to have your bars slightly wider, 10 or 20 mil wider. It's a personal preference thing. Obviously, the lower your stem is, the better the bike's going to climb. The higher your stem is, the more comfortable it's going to feel when you descend. So make sure you have a balance of that, and then you can figure it out yourself. Okay, so I've got a pretty extensive question here from Don Potter. 
I recently took my Trek Fuel 29er to my local bike shop for a full tune up, including service of the front fork as there was some play in the head tube area. Uh, the fork's been on the frame for about seven months as the frame is new as a result of a previous frame breaking. Uh, he had a call from the bike shop basically and they'd removed the front fork and discovered the steer tube had separated from the crown of the fork. They indicated they'd never seen this before and I was lucky I didn't have a catastrophic failure. Yeah, you, you really are. Um, is this something you've ever come across and is it something that should ever happen? Okay, so bear in mind that with virtually all suspension forks these days, the steer tube is press fitted with a hydraulic press. It's like a ram basically that presses them into the crown. It's a fit and forget thing. You don't ever really change that tube on there if it becomes loose or it creaks or anything you tend to change the whole whole unit and those days it's known as a CSU that's a crown steerer upper so it'll be the steerer tube the crown and the upper legs or the stanchion tubes now if it has come loose I mean you hear about them creaking every now and then I had some a few years back that did that and it's just it's unlucky you can get them the amount of thousands and thousands that are produced you'll get you know it's just quality control you'll get something slip through the net here and there but if it's actually come loose then yeah, that's a, a different thing. So I do suggest that even though it's probably outside of the warranty period, that your bike shop does speak to SRAM and Rock Shops to see if there's anything they can do just on that basis. Um, lucky, like your bike shop mechanic told you that you weren't riding it because you definitely know about it if that did go wrong. Um, also just to note that you do say that um, you're not an aggressive rider, a 55 year old intermediate rider likes to climb more and not go downhill so you haven't been haven't been pushing it. Yeah, it's just unlucky. So hopefully your bike is gonna help you get back on, on your wheels again. Good luck with that. James Young. Um, my name's James, I'm from Shropshire, and this is my question. What do you prefer? SRAM XX1 or XTR and why? Do you know what? I, I don't know if I have a preference. I think I kind of go in ebbs and flows on this. You know, sometimes I prefer SRAM, sometimes I prefer Shimano. Um, first though, it's just it's important to say why. So I was always a fan of XT originally, that's the Shimano drivetrain. It's kind of like the workhorse group set. Like it's the high end one, but you fit and forget it works really well for a long time. And when I was a young rider growing up, pre XTR, so XTR was launched in 95, XT was always the one you aspired to have. Now I had a mixture of like 400 LX and Dior and stuff like that on my bike, so XT was like the holy grail of things to get. Now when XTR came out, it's basically a racing version of the XT group set, so a really high-end finish on it, and it was lighter and just looked stunning. I mean, even though it's pretty old now, it, I think it still looks quite good. It does look dated, of course, but you have to bear in mind how ahead of the time it was. So I think XTR was all, it's always going to have a special place in my heart because I always wanted that transmission but could never have it. Skip forward several years and the XX1 drivetrain came into the market in like 2012. And that's pretty revolutionary. So not only was it like the 11 speed setup on there, the whole cassette design was totally different to Shimano. So Shimano have had a 10 speed design and before that obviously 9 speed, 8 speed, 7 speed. And it relied on a simple system of them slotting onto the cassette body and you had a lock ring to hold them on. Now what SRAM wanted to do was have a 10 tooth lower sprocket. So previously 11 was the smallest you could get to. So they had to reinvent the cassette basically to do this. And it was a one piece design that basically screwed onto a slightly different carrier and uh, didn't have a lock ring design. So from that point of view, I was blown away when SRAM delivered the XX1 because it, was, it was, truly was a revolutionary product. Of course, people have found other ways around doing this stuff now and there's 11 speed with without the 10 speed lower sprocket tooth there. But more to the point, they also brought in the one by system. So a lot of riders had started taking chain rings off and running chain guides on their bikes. But when SRAM delivered the narrow wire technology of their X-Sync chain ring, that really was a game changer. Being able to run a bike with no sort of derailleur, no sort of chain guide on it to keep stuff on, mind blowing. You know, I, I think I like XX1 and XTR equally, but for completely different reasons. And something I've said to people quite often is I actually think of Shimano and SRAM as kind of like a, a PC and a Mac. Like Shimano are a bit more business, a bit more like a PC, you know, both equally specced and very functional and do the jobs, but you know, and SRAM are a bit more fun and a bit more sort of uh, based around the user experience. So compare them a bit more to Apple as a company. But what do you guys think? Do you prefer like the SRAM approach or do you prefer the Shimano approach? Let us know in the comments. Okay, next up a question from Jean-René Houlet. Uh, whilst adjusting sag on my RockShox Monarch RT with the Debon air cam, I've noticed the stroke doesn't feel linear. It's like there's a notch. I've emptied the air, I've pumped it back up 30 PSI increments and cycled it to balance the pressure. But I still feel that notchy feeling. Does my shock need to be serviced? And what are the signs 
a shock needs to be serviced. Okay, so let's take this in reverse first and we'll look at the servicing. So RockShox tend to recommend that every 50 hours that you do a basic service. So in a fork, that's the lower leg service. In a shock, it's the same equivalent. That's the air can service. Simply letting the air pressure out of your shock, taking the can off, lubricating it, cleaning it. Basically, if you need to change the seals, do that, put it back together again. Now, it does depend on how often you ride, where you ride, the conditions you ride, how aggressively you ride. So it's kind of up to you to sort of monitor your shock and just make sure it's generally in good condition and working well. Every 100 hours, they recommend a damper service and a full service. So it's taking it apart, inspecting it, replacing O-ring seals, that sort of stuff. Now, there are a few things that this could be. So firstly, before delving into the shock, I would say, take the shock off the bike and cycle the rear end up and down and see if there's any play or any movement anywhere on the rear pivots of your bike. So something could be loose or worn out there. It's also a good time for you to check those and inspect them. Then put your shock back on and the next thing to check is to take the chain off or if you've got a Shimano mech, turn the clutch off, cycle the mech through because the clutches on the rear mechs can have quite a feeling on suspension travel, especially at the start of it. It can almost act like a low speed compression damper, like on a very minor scale, but you can feel that feedback through the pedals and sometimes through the shock at the same time. So check it's not that. Then there's a few other things it could be. So if it's the first sort of 10, 15% of the air stroke, I spoke to someone from RockShox about this earlier, it could be the air spring seal passing the little dimple that basically helps bleed the air into the negative chamber. And if it is that, that's something that exists on all shocks and you can just feel it more on some bike designs. Um, it's just a very minor thing. It doesn't affect the performance of the shock in any way. You'll notice it when you're just sat on the bike doing that. You'll never notice it when you're out riding on the trail. So it's, it's nothing to be concerned about. There is one more thing it could be if it happens further into the travel, let's just say 50% through. There's a small chance it could be air on the wrong side of the IFP, so that's the internal floating piston. And if that happens, basically the damper needs bleeding or it needs a shock service. So either way, that is something you can do yourself. Um, there's a link to the sort of site on Rock Shocks where you can download the PDS for all of those different model year shocks. And it does show you how to do that. But if you're not comfortable, speak to your local bike shop or your local suspension service center and they'll be able to do it for you. Okay, next up from Andy C. Um, two questions here. Number one, I was wondering if my bike has water in the frame, if so, what to do? It's not uncommon for water to find its way into a mountain bike frame, um, just because the nature of the way you ride them in all weather conditions. Now the place to really check this is down by the bottom bracket, because when your water sits down there, it's gonna start disintegrating your, your bearings because it will find its way in no matter how well sealed they are. So the best thing to do is remove your cranks, remove the bottom bracket from the bike, and then do it that way. But you can also take the seat post out, turn your bike upside down, um, it's always good to spray some sort of a rust inhibitor in there, something like a WT-40 or any other sort of water displacing spray, basically just to help basically disperse any water and stop any rust building up. But your bottom bracket, you wanna take care of that because that is the, the one part of the bike that really suffers of water in the frame. As far as your frame goes, it's not really gonna harm it, just pay attention to it from time to time. Uh, number two, if my wheel's just slightly out of true in the back, should I take it to a shop, leave it alone, or buy the tools to do it myself? Um, I think if you're asking that question, you probably don't want to get involved with truing the rear wheel because it's really easy, even if it's out a tiny bit, just to mess it up the other way. You gotta think that tightening spokes and loosening spokes, not only does it make the wheel, the rim go from side to side, but it actually makes it go up and down as you increase and decrease the tension. And if you get a wheel that's got a lot of hop in it, you end up with a bit of an egg-shaped wheel and you're gonna mess it up. So I have often told people that if a spoke is loose, you can nip it up tight. And if you know how to true the wheel, then you can do that, that's fine. If you don't, just go to the bike shop. It's a five minute job for them to do. It won't cost you much in labor and you'll be stuck with a decent wheel rather than a bent one. Okay, now, so last question, a nice punchy one from Michael is, what's the advantage of having boost wheels? Um, I just want to explain to you first that boost wheels aren't something you can just fit to a normal mountain bike. It has to be a boost specific bike or you have to be able to adapt it in some way. So up front, mountain bike suspension forks with a 15 mil quick release, which is the conventional axle system you see on most bikes, like the Shimano system, Fox, and um, RockShox Maxwell. They're traditionally 100 mil spaced. So 110 is boost on the front, and out back it's 142 is the normal spacing, 148 is boost. So the idea of this was really designed around plus bikes initially to give it a better chain line, basically to make sure the chains jumped out a bit, but not affect the Q factor, which is your 
where the crank spacing on the bike is. So on downhill bikes back in the day you had a wider bottom bracket and a wider back end and the chain line would be fine but your cranks would be really wide apart and that's not very efficient for long hours in the saddle. So Boost, the idea of it is to get the back end nice and wide so you've got those advantages of tyre clearance, it's about 3 mil more clearance you get and the chain line stays nice and straight but your Q factor is more efficient at the front. Now at the back, the 148 spacing does allow you to build a stronger wheel technically because you can have the flanges of the hub further apart. Now the further apart those flanges are, the better bracing angle the spokes have on a wheel. Of course you can keep going with this and 157 recently became announced that it's going to be used by Nolly as well as Mondraker and Pivot and other brands. But Boost is pretty much an industry standard now and well, standards, they annoy people. I think standards are good, but the irony of them is uh, there's always a new standard around the corner. Okay, so that was the end of this week's Ask GMBN Tech. Hopefully some of those questions have answered some things you've wanted to know. Um, if not, fire your questions in to the email address on the screen or add them in the comments below. And you never know, you might be on next week's show. So if you want to see a couple more great videos, if you want to see five, five reasons not to be a mountain biker, things that aren't so enjoyable, it's a pretty funny video, you've got to watch this right down there, it's a great one with Blake. And if you want to know five tools, that every mountain biker should have, and it's basically the basis of every sort of home toolkit setup. Click up there. As always, click on the globe to subscribe. There is new content every single week and every day in the case of GMBN itself. And as always, give us a thumbs up.